Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Kosciuszko Foundation's webinar, Touched by History, Politics and Poetics of the Polish New Wave Writers in the 1970s with Jarosław Anders. My name is Eva Zadworna. I'm Director of Cultural Affairs at the Foundation, and I want to thank you all very much for taking time out and joining us here today. Uh, as usual, a quick technical note at the beginning, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the Foundation's YouTube channel. Also, at the end of the program, following the lecture, we will run a Q&A session. Therefore, if you'd like to ask a question, please do so using the Q&A feature that should be available on your screens. This is the second episode in the series of lectures by Jarosław Anders, dedicated to Poland's new wave poets. Today's lecture specifically is dedicated to the memory of Adam Zagajewski, one of the most prominent poets of contemporary Poland and one of the leading poets of the discussed new wave formation. His death on March 21st, which by the way coincided with the UNESCO's World Poetry Day, makes this talk even more relevant. Today's presentation is organized and hosted together with the Polish program at Hunter College CUNY and with Dr. Małgorzata Pośpie, who is in charge of the program and who will lead the discussion after the lecture. Dr. Pośpie is a writer, documentary filmmaker, journalist, translator, and a photographer. She's an author of numerous publications, including novels, collection of poems, and published translations. Welcome. Thank and you. Now, for all of you who are joining us for the first time, I would like to introduce the speaker of today's webinar, a writer, translator and editor, Jarosław Anders. Mr. Anders is the author of Between Fire and Sleep, Essays on Modern Polish Poetry and Prose, published by the Yale University Press in 2009. He's also the author of numerous articles published in the New York Review of Books, The New Republic, the Los Angeles Times Book Review, and other publications. He has translated several books from English into Polish and from Polish into English. In the past, he served as a writer and broadcaster for the Voice of America and worked in the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor of the US Department of State. Mr. Ard Anders, welcome again, and thank you very, very much for agreeing to uh, give this talk uh, and sharing your wisdom, insights, and knowledge with us and with our audience. <laughs> thank you, and without further ado, well, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thanks to Eva and Malgorzata for inviting me again uh, to talk about a certain important moment um, in the history of Polish poetry, uh, associated mainly with, um, with a group known as the New Wave or Generation 68. And um, as I was preparing this talk, news reached me about uh, the death of Adam Zagajewski, who is one of the main figures um, uh, of this group. In fact, he was one of its creators, we can say, um, his book uh, that he wrote uh, together with Juliana Kornhauser titled The Unrepresented World, it was published in 1974, uh, was considered a kind of manifesto of the new uh, poetry uh, of the 70s. So I decided to change the original idea a bit and dedicated this talk to, to Adam. Uh, in the 19... 80s, uh, 1982 or three, he had to leave Poland. He settled for a while in France. And around that time he has undergone, his poetry has undergone a rather radical, though uh, perhaps not entirely unexpected uh, transformation. Uh, his poetry assumed a very different uh, tone, uh, which was a particular combination of romantic uh, ecstasy uh, and classical restraint. And the subject of his poetry also changed the old depictions of the impoverished gray world of Poland uh, under communism. It gave way to a sense of wonder uh, at the diversity and uh, mystery of, of life, especially the mystery of beauty that seems to be so out of place in this endlessly decaying, crumbling, wounded uh, world of ours. I have met Adam several times, mostly here in the United States, also in Poland, um, I wrote about him. There is a rather lengthy essay about him in my book, Between Fire and Sleep, uh, the title of which I borrowed from one of his poems, 
Um, and uh, I would like to dedicate this, this talk to, to his memory. Uh, we'll discuss his poetry and his transformation a little bit later uh, in the talk. Let me just add now that Adam was also a great lover of music. Uh, in one of his poems, he speaks about uh, a desire to hear the sound of everything. Uh, there is a new cultural uh, review publication um, called Liberties here in, published here in Washington, DC, um, which has in his first issue, initial issue, his essay on Mahler. Um, let me finish this brief remembrance of a great poet uh, of whom we'll talk later with uh, one of his poems. The poem is uh, called Three Voices. It's translated by Claire Kavanaugh, who translated practically everything that Adam uh, wrote into English. And uh, most of the translations from, uh, practically all the translations uh, from Zagajewski uh, that I'm going to use today are uh, in, in her translation. So three voices. The cloud of dusk gathers in the room. The shadows of night are growing, tame desire. On the radio, Mahler's Song of the Earth. Outside the window, blackbirds whistle carefree and loud. And I can hear the soft rustling of my blood as if snow were sliding down the mountains. These three voices, these three alien voices are speaking to me, but they don't demand anything. They make no promise. In the background, Somewhere in the meadow, the cortege of night, full of hollow whispers, forms and reforms, trying to get it, get in order. Uh, but let's get to the very beginning of the road of Zagajewski and his contem contemporaries. Last time we talked mostly about uh, the political and cultural context uh, of the emergence of the literary scene. Uh, this time I would like to focus more on, um, on their poetry, on how they tried to respond to the conditions um, their generation had to cope with. Uh, at the very beginning, as we see, there was a relatively small group of writers, intellectuals, mainly poets. Uh, the names that are usually invoked are those of Stanislav Barancha, Kreshat Krynitsky, Julian Kornhauser, Adam Zagajewski, uh, and Eva Lipska although there were many and many more, of course. They lived through the protests of 1968 in Poland, followed by the protests of 1970 and 76. They felt something rather important was happening around them. They wanted to participate, or at least to reflect this new sensation uh, in the writing. They called for literature that would be bolder in expressing doubt about or even disagreement with the reality that is the reality of living under communism, despite censorship and ideological limitations. In the critical writings, they didn't exactly specify how all this uh, was to be achieved, what poetic means or what strategies needed to be uh, employed. Uh, they were perceived as a literary group, even a movement largely based on uh, the set of uh, postulates they were identified with, but did they in fact create a common uh, poetics or an immediately recognizable style? Was there such thing as a typical new wave poem? And to go in even further, was there such thing as the new wave group, school movement, whatever? Or was it perhaps just a convenient uh, creation uh, of the critics? These questions, tend to come up uh, more and more frequently with the passage of time. And even some uh, members uh, of the group uh, provide confusing, sometimes contradictory uh, answers to this question. It is a difficult question because as I will try to demonstrate, the group did display some similarities as well as some uh, very profound differences. In my view, there was a certain type, mode of expression, even a certain type of a poem <clears throat> that at least in the 70s was considered to be typically typical for, for the new wave. This was, uh, these were poems that as a rule were focused on a particular, usually absurd uh, 
situation, uh, ritual, iconography, uh, and language um, of officialdom, communist officialdom. As such poems were frequently moralizing about the need of staying true to oneself, not compromising, remaining loyal to friends, traditions, values. Adam Zagajewski in, in a poem, one of his early poems um, called Simply Truth, uh, puts it very directly. He says, inhale the deepest layers of the air and slowly remembering the laws of syntax, tell the truth. truth. That's what you serve. In your left hand, you hold love and in your right, uh, hatred. Uh, some of those poems were very serious, even a bit bombastic perhaps. More often than not, they were light, lighter, mocking, ironic, self-ironic. Uh, all poets discussed here wrote such topical, politically charged poems at some time, especially in the 70s and early 80s. Uh, but this mode uh, of speaking is probably best exemplified in the writing of Stanislaw Baranjak uh, of that period, especially in his books, Morning Journal, 1972, uh, Artificial Respiration, 1974, uh, I Know It Is Wrong, 1977, and Triptych of Concrete Exhaustion and Snow, 1980. As we see, Baranjak was very prolific in the 70s. Two of those books, I Know It Is Wrong and Artificial Respiration, had to be published outside Poland. It was impossible to, and to publish them um, officially in Poland. In this and other volumes, we find poems that try to sum up the reality of communism in one symbolic image or, or situation. For example, a very frequently quoted poem by Baranczak is a poster uh, with had held slightly high with a sincere gaze penetrating the future, which as everybody knows, is always one step higher on the escalator of progress and whose radiance hurts only the bloodshot, the spectacle eyes of the nearsighted. It's their own fault, they read too much and it goes on. Then there is another similar poem by Baranczak titled The Rostrum from which uh, political speeches are endlessly being delivered too tall for a pre -deer, too small for a sentry box. Although not together in the same way from straightforward and smooth planed planks of phrases, it has stopped halfway between the humility of prayer and the haughty intimation of a sentry's password. And now compels one to adopt a posture intermediate between genuflection and standing at detention. Uh, in Artificial Respiration, Baranja creates a persona uh, whom he calls NN, similar to Zbigniew Herbert's persona of Mr. Cogito, except that where Mr. Cogito is of, often and often bumbling and sometimes helpless, but essentially decent and deeply reflective uh, person, as his name, to think, I think, um, indicates, NN seems totally resigned to his miserable, unfree life, uh, is even eager to justify it, ready to compromise, even when occasionally uh, having uh, some pangs of conscience. NN is an abbreviation of Nazvisko Nieznane, a person of unknown name, which also coincides with the, with the Latin term for the, for the same uh, nomen nestio. Uh, we follow this creature through the landscape of human debasement, despair, boredom, absurdity. We observe him when he's reluctantly waking up to face uh, a new day, trying to pray, listening to the radio, performing morning exercises, using a, a public restroom, even trying to commit suicide at some point, but uh, changing his mind at the last moment. Uh, there is a lot of sad humor um, in those poems, but also a creeping terror at how awfully uh, human existence can be deformed and emptied you know, of all its meaning. But Eintracht is also extremely skillful using uh, word games, puns, homonyms, homophones, false entomologies, uh, 
uh, for rhetorical and comical effect, uh, usually starting with some cliche uh, or official jargon and taking it through several transformations uh, to review a new meaning or to unmask its total meaningless. For instance, one of his poems, Cry Rad, uh, the country of the Soviets, as the Soviet Union was sometimes called in newspapers, beca becomes Rai Krat, the paradise of prison prison bars, or cry Arab, slave country. Uh, that's called spoonerism, switching uh, elements of two, two, two words uh, for, for comical effect. Uh, in the poem, Laying of the Wreaths and Flowers, a solemn ceremony, we have phrases that link wreaths, ginza, with coronary disease, choroba, ginzova, calcification, zwapnienie of the veins, with lime pits, and so on. Uh, Baranczak used this kind of political innuendos most frequently and most skillfully, but uh, all poets under discussion occasionally uh, wrote poems uh, like that. Uh, if you collected them under one cover, one could even think that they might have been written by, by the same person. Mm, take Richard Krinitsky's poem, we really, really didn't know in the volume Collective Organism published in 1975, which describes in rather pla plaintive and perhaps deliberately naive terms, the feelings of a participant uh, of the 1968 March events. Maybe we were children, we lacked experience, we only knew we'd been forced to believe in lies, and we really didn't know what else we wanted, besides respect for human rights and truths and then continues, and we really didn't know that armored cars could be sent against the helpless, against us who are still children, armed only with ideas that we'd been taught in schools and that the same schools untaught us. Uh, Julian uh, Kornhauser's poem, uh, May Day Grandstand, uh, from the volume For Us, With Us, uh, Zanas uh, Znami, uh, published a little bit later in 1985, uh, describes a group of people on a tribune, probably during a May Day parade, and it's almost like a variant of Baranchak's The Rostrum. Uh, the legs hide behind the red cloth, the toil-worn, wiry, farmer work, worker legs. We can only see busts, swarthy, mighty, bursting with pride, while the legs last silently the crowds condemned to the only half a joy. Uh, during martial law, Kornhauser wrote a series of poems um, that were collected in uh, 1982 in a volume, Hooray, uh, that I mentioned in my previous talk, uh, in which he uses the language of the street to probe the minds of, of the common people. Uh, one sample here is everything depends on the person. People got smarter now, the locksmith says. When there was a shortage or something failed, they blamed the state, the government. Now they see it all depends on the person because when a house has crooked walls or furniture falls apart, how is it the state's fault? It's the person who made it. In uh, Adam Zagajewski's book, uh, Communique, uh, 1972, uh, and Meat Stores, uh, 1975, we also find a number of poems in which the realities of life under communism are presented metaphorically, sometimes parabolically, uh, but very transparently uh, to his readers. For instance, Christ, unshaven in dirty clothes, is being crucified by soldiers in unbuttoned uniforms. Language is an animal constantly trying to escape from the cage of the mouth, only to be arrested just after a few letters. The city is a waiting room in which we have to write reports to the police and betray mm, our friends. Even Eva Lipska, who was always uh, somehow apart from the group uh, and even refused to identify herself with, with, with it, uh, <clears throat> reaches for this set of devices in some of her poems, especially in her fourth volume of poetry, uh, which is titled actually the fourth volume of poetry, Czwarty Zbiór Wierszy, 1974, and in Storage of Darkness, Przechowania Ciemności, in 1985. 
in, um, in a poem, dictation, for instance, grammatical terms evoke political realities. Decline, but not in every case. Take care to place a period after certain dates. After others, a pause. Um, in exam, a poem that uh, was particularly liked by the censorship, which stopped, its, prevented its publication on many occasions, a competition for the position of the king is being held and a perfect candidate who already is a king is finally selected and is ceremoniously handed the nation like a diploma bound in leather or bound in skin, since this is the same word in Polish. Uh, so, such poems were met at that time, as I remember very well, with enthusiasm, excitement, satisfaction. They were read at the gatherings, uh, passed around, sometimes set to music. Um, today, we have probably to classify them as light verse, as, as forms of satire, as uh, poetic feuilletons, in which being witty is more important than being profound or innovative. Mm, there wasn't much discovery in those poems. They expressed uh, in a clever way what everybody knew. And they weren't meant to convince anybody. They were preaching to the choir. That is pretty much um, all of us. And the choir, as we know, uh, likes this kind of preaching, preaching. But, and this is my, my main, main thesis, the strength of this formation, its real contribution and enduring a value um, is actually elsewhere. When you look carefully at uh, the whole poetic output, even in those highly politicized 70s, you'll notice that this type of poetic pamphleteering was hardly the dominant form. For the most part, those poets uh, were preoccupied with a whole range of other subjects we typically encounter in poetry, love, separation, loss, death, metaphysical uh, musings. Uh, in many of those poems, uh, the realities of life, including those shaped by politics, do appear and do play a role but there's a part of a whole tapestry of experience. They infiltrate the personal internal space of the poet, sometimes by chance, uh, but they rarely actually dominate it completely. Uh, Richard Krenitsky's poem, Parting Decline, in his book, Collective Organism, uh, 1975, starts as a meditation on some unspecified personal loss. But suddenly, strange images, memories, citations start to crowd in. He quotes the line from uh, Jan Kochanowski, the 16th century poet considered the father of Polish literature. The void that fills my house is so immense, and then continues, oh, Koszczańska Street, and a view of the street, shop signs, world of stockings in Gliwice. They shout, you dumb fuck, carry it like a banner in a certain town on a certain morning. Zygmunt Krasinski, posthumous relations with a certain soul in the local library. Krasinski in this period, in the 70s, was also fond of open form uh, poets, poems that were sometimes compared by critics to streams, rivers, tides that carry with great force images from different areas of reality. Uh, a very long poem, uh, Outskirts, mentions wars, climate change, American astronauts in a space station, then suddenly Christ appears in a kind of Hollywood glory with radiating stigmata. You know, but since he chose to return somewhere in Eastern Europe, in the evening he's detained by an officer of the law who's completed Marxist-Leninist night school. True, he has no ID or passport and he's never held a job, but as he explains, the vision of a better future drew him. He doesn't need to eat or drink since he feeds on light and feels love for people, which can possibly justify a show trial. Uh, this scene reminiscent of the Grand Inquisitor parable in Dostoevsky's Brothers Karamazov quickly dissolves in a rush of other images, young girls carrying plastic bags with the face of Janis Joplin, a car accident, Warsaw Pact armies invading Czechoslovakia, a military coup uh, taking place somewhere in Latin America, rising prices of food, fuel, uh, 
um, and ends with pregnant women carrying the death under their hearts, pressing their temples and gazing into this dazzling gulf of tomorrow's day. We are in a hostile, nightmarish, chaotic world impregnated with death. Um, this perception is definitely rooted in, um, in the Polish or generally Soviet bloc uh, experience of the time, but it becomes a part of the polyphony uh, of the world. Zagajewski in the 70s also tries to grasp uh, the Polish reality in its totality, fluidity, in the inseparable blend of the uh, political and non-political, public and private. One of the most interesting poems of this period, Zagajewski's poems, is The New World, which is <clears throat> moving with the flow of images, events, fleeting references to historical facts, names, places, associations that form themselves into uh, the stream of consciousness of a Polish everyman. Uh, and is punctuated with a repeated a refrain warning, don't be loud, don't go to sleep. A young leader will emerge from every old one. A hangman sewn into his body's uniform, don't be lulled by his barely literate diploma. They can err at any moment. Lawns become volcanoes and a tank will emerge from every car. It is a kind of I see it as a kind of apocalyptic Polish wasteland uh, of, of the times of the of declining communism. Julian Kornhauser, Julian Kornhauser's poems in the volume In Factories, We Pretend to be Said Revolutionaries in 1973, which many critics uh, hailed as the poet's, poet's new wave statement. Um, history, politics, ideologies appear in brief mentions cryptic references to the October Revolution, Lenin, Mayakovsky, Rosa Luxemburg, uh, modernist revolutionary artists, but they are, as in Krynitsky and Zagajewski, uh, parts of a much broader uh, network of symbols that seem to represent the modern mind's search for something higher, purer, unattainable, which cannot be realized in this inherently mm, imperfect, impure world. Lipska um, is a poet both of private dramas and of history and collective fates. Uh, but for her, the concept of history and of uh, collective fate um, is more universal, I think, than uh, those of her new wave uh, contemporaries. They include not only the realities of communist poet, Poland poet, but also larger periods of a Polish history, including the war, the Second World War, that she evokes very often, uh, views of what we can call modern civilization in general, and also tragedies that strike uh, anybody, anywhere, as in an earthquake, a dinner uh, on the table strewn with rubble, siblings' little hands holding shards of cups, death came with current gem, still unswallowed. Some of the poems uh, of those poets that we're talking about, despite their programs and their declarations of representing, presenting reality, do not seem to be concerned with anything that uh, can be easily um, situated uh, in, in the Polish here and now. And yet, in my view, uh, in a careful reading, we can detect traces, shadows of this here and now in certain types of metaphors uh, or images that keep returning in the writing, no matter what the subject. Anatomical metaphors like breathing or blood circulating, the most basic functions of life mm, often presented as an effort, uh, as a struggle. Parts of human body, bones, skulls, internal organs seem to extend outwards and come into an unpleasant, painful contact with, uh, with the external uh, world. Uh, I wrote in the introduction to my book, Between Fire and Sleep, that for us, totalitarianism was, uh, I quote myself, a negative sign, a dark star that held within its orbit huge chunks uh, of human experience. And I later say that it suffused it with its sickening and deforming uh, radiation. 
a bit of, of a fancy metaphor, I guess. But that was how he felt it. Zagajewski wrote a, a poem, um, I don't pretend and don't pretend to be someone else, in which he tells us that we cannot pretend to live as if we lived in another place at another time. We cannot fully separate ourselves from the circumstances in which we dwell or create a perfect asylum of the mind. It wouldn't be right and it probably wouldn't be possible. And the poems, that, the poets that we, that we are talking about seem to be very keenly aware of who they were and where they were. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, some critics to, today call into question the very existence of a group called the New Wave, uh, because they say it did not develop its own uh, distinctive poetics, mm, any common uh, recognizable set of poetic devices or a style. Well, I think I have shown that there were certain poetic tropes, even certain types of poems that they had in common. It can be argued that their differences were probably more larger and more significant than their similarities. And yet uh, there was a certain commonality of sensibilities and responses and that can be detected perhaps at a deeper, less obvious level. <coughs> Julian Kornhauser uh, put it very, very well during a public discussion about um, the new wave uh, that was held uh, in uh, 2005. Um, we were marked by history, he said. And that's, that's, these are his, his word, words. We were marked by history. And we we're trying to say, say it in our own name, but also in the name of our whole generation, to say that we belong to this generation. Uh, later, he says, from the theoretical point of view, uh, there was no such thing as the new wave poetics, but our individual languages met at a certain moment, started broadcasting on the same wavelength. Separate voices started talking to one another. We were looking for the same props, created very similar heroes. We addressed a very specific reader who understood perfectly well what we meant. So they were together and they were separate, um, as poets usually are. When the historical pressure started lessening, they also moved in, in different directions. For some of them, it's my guess, uh, it was probably a return or rediscovery of what was from the very beginning, perhaps, uh, the very source of their poetry. <clears throat> Stanisław Barańczak, excuse me. Stanisław Barańczak, who died <clears throat> in America in 2014, was in the States where, when martial law was declared in Poland, as was I. And he wrote a series of <clears throat> touching poems called Restoration of Order in the form of poetic letters to his friends, many of whom were at that time in detention or underground hiding from the police. But later his interests also started to shift, in fact, to explode in many directions. Metaphysical meditations, discussions with the absent or hidden God, reflections on the fate of an emigre, pokes at American culture and life. And on the other hand, on the other end of the spectrum, poetic jokes linguistic games and experiments for which he'd been known earlier in his political uh, writing, um, but now became, they became carefree, seemingly free of any serious considerations, played for the, for the sheer pleasure uh, of playing. Uh, and the same was, it was his translation. He was a consummate translator from many languages, but primarily from the English. And his translations included the 17th century English metaphysical poets, Shakespeare, he translated a number of plays by Shakespeare, uh, but also songs by the Beatles, all sorts of light and comic verse. It is that a complete new persona emerged from this former political satirist, moralist, and brave, selfless, 
a political activist. Julian Kornhauser's last um, uh, new book of poetry uh, was published in 2007, and it's it's called Origami. Uh, contains several very short imagist poems capturing seemingly incidental moments or sensations, a bit like William Carlos Williams. Uh, for instance, this little poem, Union, uh, on the branch, a rook pecks a frozen crust of bread. It works hard and persistently. Under the tree, a second rook catches the falling crumbs in midair. Um, but he also, you know, Kornhauser, un unlike the others, I would say, also returns to the past, uh, uh, for instance, to the communist past, for instance, in the poem, The Police Files, a million and a half names, 240,000 catalogued, the perpetrators and their victims, agents and candidates for agents. And among the files, only one live moth without a signature. And that, that refers to the list of secret police collaborators, uh, basically paid informers of the police. And that was made, the list was made public under the unusual circumstances in the 1990s. Uh, Richard Krynicki is running today, uh, together with his wife, a small publishing house, A5. Uh, and his last two uh, volumes, Stone, Frost, uh, 2011 and Haiku, Haiku of the Masters, he has moved um, totally towards short, meditative, gnomic, aphoristic poems, clearly influenced by Eastern philosophy and Eastern uh, mysticism. Uh, Adam Zagajewski, as I mentioned earlier, um, his transformation was probably the most radical or at least most eloquently articulated, explained. Uh, first of all, in his uh, essay, Solidarity and Solitude, Solidarność i Samotność, published in, in Polish in Paris in 1986. In it, he writes, to be a Pole, to participate in the work of Polish literature is practically the same as becoming a member of a religious order with very strict rules. Um, he says also that uh, it instills in the writer and, and the reader uh, a certain false sense of innocence because all evil is located comfortably outside, somewhere else. We are the innocent, we are the pure ones. Uh, he continues, we have to conquer totalitarianism in passing on our way to greater things. And those greater things for him were beauty, the inexpressible sense of unity, of existence of the world and even mystical uh, ecstasy. He said in an interview a few years ago that under solidarity in martial law before he left Poland, he was very active. He engaged in cultural position. He was conducting underground seminars um, in churches and private apartments, but he was also undergoing a creative crisis, suffocating, writing very little. The opposition, he said um, in an interview, was beautiful, but less and less exciting intellectually. Communism had been intellectually defeated long time ago. It was no longer a passionate battle over ideas, but only a battle with institutions and offices. Uh, so communism was no longer a worthy opponent for our poetic energies, you know, it's kind of waste of waste of, uh, of our, uh, our time, um, something else was, was needed. And his first volume, um, his first two volumes published after this change uh, of vision, uh, Letter, Ode to Plurality and uh, To Go to Lvov, um, Ode to Plurality published in 1983 and To Go to Lvov in 1985, um, contains two very important poems that happen to be uh, the title poems of the book. To go to Lvov, um, of the books. To go to Lvov starts like a nostalgic trip back in time and to the city, Lvov, where Adam was born and uh, which in a sense no longer existed. It was a trip uh, the poet made together with, with his father. 
before the war, the city was uh, within Polish borders uh, with predominantly Polish population. After the war, it became um, part of the Soviet Ukraine. Now it is a major city of independent Ukraine. The trip was made still under, under Soviet times. So the poem is about chasing after a phantom, the phantom of the city. But because of this phantasmagoric uh, quality, uh, the city becomes everything. Uh, it summons a multitude of images, some remembered, some invented, perhaps free associations. There is a shadow of death and pain, uh, and pain of a, of, of, of a loss, but also a sense of abundance, strangely even joy. Um, a short quote. There was always too much of love. No one could comprehend its borrows, hear the murmur of each stone scorched by the sun. At night, the Orthodox Church's silence was unlike that of the cathedral. The Jesuits baptized plants leaf by leaf, but they grew, grew so mindlessly, and joy hovered everywhere. The loss, the disintegration of a real place and becomes um, a sort of liberation. Mm -hmm. It reminds me uh, of a poem, a phrase from, from Zbigniew Herbert's poem, A Journey. Um, Home has gone, there is a cloud over the world. Uh, so Zagajewski's Lvov is no longer a city, it's a universe that cannot be contained uh, within, within any borders, spatial or temporal. O to plurality is a praise of the pure ecstasy of life, of, quote, a wide run of poetry, the shock of love, the pleasure of the senses, the abundance of experience, two eyes, two hands, 10 inventive fingers, and only one ego. Um, in this poem, one hears almost laughter, mockery of any attempts to stem this mighty river of experience and joy by oppression, tanks, and secret police. Zagajewski, this is probably the most important part of his new persona, was also searching for, uh, for, for a source of mature uh, affirmation, of hope, despite against anything that we know about the world we live in. Uh, it is a not notable and, and very noble effort because it's so rare in contemporary in, in poetry or contemporary culture in general. Um, when we take um, the last look at, uh, at the poetry of 1970s and 80s, um, we, what, we, what we see today, what remains, what continues to speak to us, uh, what transcends the, the place and time in, in which it was uh, created. Um, to put it very briefly and very simply, this is poetry about living under extreme pressure. Uh, in the modern era, particularly any true artistic expression is a response to some kind of uh, pressure. It is a form of uh, disagreement with something. Pressure can be external or internal, but sometimes it is impossible to tell one from the other. And our poets were particularly attuned to this strange mixture of forces that, uh, that shapes our lives. Um, here in America, we seem to be far removed from Poland in the 70s. But look how many pressures we are subjected to every day. Um, how many lies and distortions in politics and the media in any form of official discourse that imperceptibly trickle into our private spaces. Uh, not surprisingly, uh, I think there is a lot of poetry <clears throat> here in the United States that is deeply uh, involved in social and political realities that invade, shape, um, and deform uh, our um, internal spaces. I think about the poetry of the beat generation, for instance, the poetry of minorities, African-American poetry, feminist poetry, for example, the American poet and feminist Adrienne Rich uh, talked about her involvement in politics, gender politics, and also politics 
in general, she was involved in the protests against the Vietnam War in terms very similar to those uh, of the new wave. Um, but uh, Adam Zagajewski's um, death, his, his passing, uh, makes us painfully aware that something very unique um, is perhaps drawing to an end. Uh, this poetry, in fact, all Polish poetry um, in between 1956 and the 80s, including the poetry of Miłosz, Herbert, Szymborska, Ruzewicz, um, was, uh, was quite unique. Everything has come together, poetic personalities, lyrical intensity, public relevance, taken together, it was a phenomenon that had no uh, equivalent, in my view, anywhere else in the world. And uh, the representatives of this phenomenon are leaving the stage. Uh, Adam Zagajewski's career uh, illustrates very well how something born out of a particular, even local uh, experience, how easily it can become universal. His status, not only in Polish, uh, but also international letters, and he was one of the few, few persons who actually gained this international, uh, international status, um, is due, of course, to his uncommon poetic talent, but also to the fact that his sensitivity seemed to correspond, seemed to, to, to be attuned uh, to something characteristic uh, in, in our times in general. Uh, perhaps it is a, a disagreement with the prevailing pessimism of modern culture, a disagreement with disagreement, one could say. Um, as I mentioned, he was searching uh, for, um, for a source of hope, uh, of affirmation um, against humanity's amassed knowledge of an unlimited disaster. Uh, one of his poems that became particularly famous uh, when it was published by the New Yorker right after the attacks of 9-11 uh, um, is called uh, try to praise the mutilated world. The poem was not written for this tragic occasion. It was written earlier. And it was, um, in fact, uh, inspired by the author's trip to Lvov and the surrounding villages. Uh, the writer uh, said in one of, one of the interviews, this was one of the strongest impression uh, I ever had. Uh, there were these empty villages with some apple trees going wild. And I saw the villages became the prey of nettles. Nettles were everywhere. There were these broken houses. It became, in my memory, this mutilated world, these villages. And at the same time, they were beautiful. It was in the summer, beautiful weather. It's something that I reacted to, this contrast between uh, beauty and disaster. So to conclude, I would like to read this poem uh, in English, uh, in the translation of Claire Kavanagh, of course, and then uh, in Polish, if I may. Um, try to praise the mutilated world. Remember June's long days and wild strawberries drops of rosé wine, the nettles that methodically overgrow the abandoned homesteads of exiles. You must praise the mutilated world. You watch the stylish yachts and ships. One of them had a long trip ahead of it while salty oblivion awaited others. You've seen the refugees going nowhere. You've heard the executioners sing joyfully. You should praise the mutilated world. Remember the moments when we were together in a white room and the curtain fluttered. Return in thought to the concert where music flared. You gathered acorns in the park in autumn and leaves edit over the earth's scars. Praise the mutilated world and the gray feather a trash lost, and the gentle light 
that strays and vanishes and returns. Um, and in Polish, spróbuj opiewać okaleczony świat. Pamiętaj o długich dniach czerwca i o poziomkach kroplach wina rosé, o pokrzywach, które metodycznie zarastały opuszczone do mostwa wygnanych. Musisz opiewać okaleczony świat. Patrzyłeś na eleganckie jachty i okręty. Jeden z nich miał przed sobą długą podróż, a inny czekała tylko słona nicość. Widziałeś uchodźców, którzy szli do nikąd. Słyszałeś oprawców, którzy radośnie śpiewali. Powinieneś opiewać okaleczony świat. Pamiętaj o chwilach, kiedy byliście razem w białym pokoju i firanka poruszyła się. Wróć myślą do koncertu, kiedy wybuchła muzyka. Jesienią zbierałeś żołędzie w parku, a liście wirowały nad bliznami ziemi. Opiewaj okaleczony świat i szare piórko zgubione przez drozda i delikatne światło, które błądzi i znika i powraca. Bardzo dziękuję. Thank you so much for your excellent reflection and in-depth analysis of the poetry of the new wave uh, generation. I really um, thank you for reading this beautiful and terrifying, terrifying poem. And it shows me how poetry, Polish poetry and poetry can be very universal. Like the universalism is born from this personal sensitivity, from this trip, with his power to love into villages, and then is um, it's getting universal. Like a lot of uh, a lot of readers can actually be connected to it. So thank you so much. It was wonderful to hear you. I would like to start our conversation by asking how the poets of this generation defined the role of the poet. Well, at, at the beginning, they, I mean, in the, the, the period that we focused on in, in the 70s, uh, they defined it uh, pretty much like, you know, the, the, the Polish po literature is defined throughout, throughout history. That means as a, as a kind of civic activity. Um, this, this, this understanding of poetry comes and goes, you know, there are, there are generations that re rebel against it and they, they return to it. And they, they started, as, as we talked uh, last time, you know, in this very tense historical moment, and they responded to the historical moment. So it was a, a, public, a public duty. Uh, later on, when, as I said, the, the, the pressure, political pressure lessened or became too, too trivial. Adam Zagajewski speaks at some point that it's like, you know, he felt sometimes like an, a knight in armor, a shining armor, uh, going to battle against a toad. You know, going to battle against uh, windmills is one thing, but going to battle against a toad is is, is kind of disgraceful. So, so they started to reevaluate it and 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 look at uh, a metaphysical a metaphysical um, uh, role of poetry as as a kind of conduit to. The, the higher things that Zagajewski talks. Interestingly, that Zagajewski and uh, Baranczak, who were probably the most um, typical personalities of the of the of the new wave movement in the 70s, they both moved into metaphysical in in in, in directions of metaphysics. Um, Zagajewski very seriously, uh, uh, Baranczak sometimes in a kind of lighter and, and, and joking mode, but metaphysics was was for them important. Uh, Baranczak wrote in one of his essays that actually metaphysics is everywhere. You know, when he describes his life in the, the triptych of um, uh, the boredom, the, of, um, the triptych of concrete, boredom and snow, he describes the life in Poland. He actually thinks about, uh, thinks and writes about a metaphysical experience. So poetry in, in, in Poland always, always moves between those two um, uh, poles, you know, the civic, civic duty, this being a member, as, as Zagajewski said, of a, 
<clears throat> of, a, of a religious order, you know, of a strict rule, you know, which of course constricts and limits one imagination, you know, you are a custodian of a certain values rather than free experiment or free spirit that can, can do whatever they want. And the, the opposite, that means something that we have to abandon, you know, the, 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 the reality has to be moved, left aside or moved behind and, and, and we move to the higher, higher things. So, so it's interesting to, to watch this um, movement uh, of, the, of the pendulum between, between those two, uh, two, uh, two extremes in the history of Polish literature in general, and also in the history of this particular generation. Next question for you, um, Pani Anders. Did, poet, did poetry, literature, art give them, the poets, the freedom? Or do you think that the poetry, the literature, the art gives us the freedom? Well, it gave us freedom. Um, I would assume that for a poet, uh, writing poetry is an act of freedom. Um, it gave us, that means the readers of, the, of that time, um, a sense of freedom, a sense of a space in which we, mental space at least, in which we could be free. And that was, I think, the great um, value of this poetry at that particular time. You know, as I said, it was, th those poems were circulated, they were, they, they were read in various meetings and, and sometimes made into songs or theater experiences and we kind of gathered in small small groups and we felt somehow free i cannot say that we were free totally but <clears throat> we felt somehow somehow free we were looking for for niches of freedom cracks in the in, in the concrete you know, of the of the system and, and poetry was this kind of poetry was one one of those those cracks you know the same with poetry of Zbigniew of herbert the same with poetry of Wisława uh, Szymborska, you know, they gave us um, a sense of participating in something that the authorities, the, the, the regime, uh, have absolutely no control of. So, so that was a sense of freedom. Um, I, I think poetry is really about freedom. You know, you can understand and define this freedom in different, different ways, but every poet I I talk to uh, talks about freedom, you know, and uh, every poet that I know speaks about the, a sense of liberation, you know, working on this white piece of paper and mm, creating worlds that that they can somehow somehow take responsibility for and 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 con control of in, in a certain way. Thank you. So, um, what is the most important for you personally in the poetry of this generation? Um, well, I'm probably not the best, <laughs> the best critic of it because it is my generation. So I, as, as I said earlier, you know, it, <clears throat> it is speaking to me in a specific, uh, specific way. But uh, as I was trying to, to, to explain today was this particular mixture of uh, the historical, the, the external and, and the personal, uh, the, the, the mixture, the mix that, that is our uh, our in, in internal space, uh, the uh, the awareness that you cannot detach yourself from the conditions in which you live, be it communist Poland or the United States today or um, Ireland. You know, I, if I had more time, I would speak about you know certain influences this poetry had on on, on writers, uh, on writers uh, abroad, especially especially some Irish writers, Tom Paulin, you know, Seamus Heaney, um, where Seamus Heaney was collaborating with, with Baranczak, they translated, uh, uh, they translated uh, uh, some, some Polish poetry together. Uh, so so there, were, there, were, there were certain, certain uh, influences, and I think that that testifies to the fact that there was a unique unique phenomenon you know how this phenomenon we can we can define in this phenomenon in many ways but it was something unique and something important not only for us not only for my generation but also for others even even uh, abroad even even in different different countries feeling somehow you know ireland was always you know close to poland in a sense because they they they, they also are living under the the pressure of, of of history especially northern ireland you know the, 
to, to both, both uh, poets from Northern Ireland. Um, so, so that is, I think, the, 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 the value of it, you know, that it had uh, an imprint, an impression on, 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 on poetry in general. Thank you once again. Thank you so much. We don't have questions. So um, it was excellent lecture. Um, thank you for your knowledge. Thank you for sharing it with, uh, with us. And thank you for reading Adam Zagajewski uh, poem uh, at the end. It was really, um, it was really good, very, very, very moving, very moving for me. And I hope for our, our uh, viewers also. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Anders. It was excellent, excellent, uh, very emotional for me um, event. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks again. And again, so I'm sharing enthusiasm of Dr. Poshpik, and I will also would, would like to also express my big uh, thank you to Yaroslav Anders for this wonderful uh, presentation, for shining light on the freedom writers, freedom writers of the 1970s and bringing their words, their written words, especially of Adam Zagajewski and other poets to us directly and figuratively. Thank you very much, Dr. Poshpik, for the initiative yeah. and your contribution to this program. Thank you all who joined us today. Our next episode in the literary series will be very shortly because uh, next week, April 15, and this time, this episode, next episode will be dedicated to Polish prose. Um, this time um, we will be discussing the literature of Andrzej Stasiuk, one of the most prominent and most successful and internationally recognized uh, Polish contemporary writers. And Dr. Krzysztof Gajewski of the Institute of Literary Research of the Polish Academy of Sciences will be speaking and uh, delving into works of Andrzej Stasiuk and the literature of periphery uh, in his uh, lecture titled, I Got Imprisoned for Rock and Roll. Next week, April 15, 2 p.m. We hope to be able to host you then too. Um, maybe on the last note, the Kościuszka Foundation is a membership organization. So if you are a member, that's wonderful. Thank you. If no, you are most welcome to join us as a member. And uh, now let me just say to wish you to wish you a wonderful evening, wonderful the rest of the day. And we hope to host you and see you all soon. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.